praise and his glory. Now let's explain all of this. First place, somebody was asking me uh, recently what was a good scripture uh, to show folks that uh, you couldn't be saved and then unsaved. Well, here's a good one here. If you've been saved, see, it says, uh, in whom, uh, having believed, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I can't imagine anything in the world that could be more secure than something that's sealed by the Holy Spirit. Can you? Looks like to me that would be uh, uh, about as secure as you could get. Well, hold your finger there and let's turn over to the fourth uh, chapter. We might as well get uh, all of this tied together. Uh, chapter 4, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, this would seem to indicate that your redemption hasn't yet happened, wouldn't it? It says sealed until the day of redemption. And back again in the first uh, chapter, it said that, um, who, uh, 14th verse again, or 114, who is the earnest of our inheritance, this is the Holy Spirit, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now what it's saying is that the Holy Spirit of God was given to us as a guarantee. You know, in the real estate uh, real estate transaction, what earnest money is. It's not, it's not the down payment. It's that amount of money that you put up to show your good faith and to say, I really mean business, so here's $100 on the deal or $500 on the deal. You put down earnest money. Well, uh, this is saying when God saves you, he, he puts down the earnest money, and that's the Holy Spirit. He gives you the Spirit of God to let you know that he's going to go on through it. The fact that he gives you with the Holy Spirit of God, you should know that he's going to go through with the deal. He's not, he's not going to back out. He's put down the earnest money. Now, you are a tripartite being. That means uh, that you have three aspects. You are body, soul, and spirit. This is said in so many words in the fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians. You are body, soul, and spirit. The minute you receive Christ, your spirit is redeemed. God receives back your spirit. The minute you receive Christ as your Savior, so that you can communicate with God and do his work. Now, the redemption of your soul is a process. Now, your soul is the real you. See, that's, that's you. And, uh, uh, This is a process, the redemption of your soul. It starts the day you're saved, and it will not be completed until uh, God makes you like Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. When you go through the judgment seat of Christ, you come back, just, uh, come out of that just like Christ. So it's a process. Eternal rewards are based upon the extent to which that process is completed in this life. As you yield yourself to the Spirit of God, He, through your spirit, remake your soul or redeem your soul. The redemption of your soul is a process. It, it begins the very moment that your spirit is redeemed. But the redemption of your body is something that's going to happen in the future. That's the consummation of your salvation. Everybody's body will be redeemed at the same time, both dead and alive. All those who died are now in the grave, uh, the body has been placed in the grave, uh, the redemption of their body will take place at the same time the redemption of your body will. This redemption of the body is described in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 13th verse, also in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. And it's promised in Philippians 3.21, where, where uh, the Bible says, He shall change this vile body likened to a, uh, like, and to a body fashioned likened to his own glorious body. Philippians 3.21. So the consummation of your redemption is yet to come. 
Now you become a child of God. You become a child of God positionally as soon as as you receive Christ. Because in John 1, 12, we're told, as many as received him, Christ, to them gave you the power to become the sons or the children of God, or the authority to become the children of God. You became a child of God by new birth when you received Christ as your Savior. But you're not adopted into the heavenly family of God until your redemption is complete. Because you just aren't fit to be manifested. See, it's called, we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Which, well, this is in the 8th chapter, too. Uh, hold your place here again in Ephesians. Let's go back there to the 8th chapter of Romans again so we can understand this. This may be a whole new thought to you, some of you, but it's a very precious thought. Churches ought to be teaching us. The, 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 the church systems that we live under today leave us so ignorant of these real deep truths of God. It's real pitiful. But if you counted on your church to give it to you, you just wouldn't get it. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's why God raises up these Bible studies, because he wants you to know these truths. Now, we're back in the 8th chapter of Romans. You're holding your place in Ephesians, because we're not through with that. Where he says, 8.18. Well, we might as well go on back a little further. Let's go back to the 14th verse. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You're already a son of God by rebirth. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let's see what that means. The spirit himself bears witness that we, that with our spirit, see, this is the spiritual redemption, that we are now the children of God. And as children, then we're heirs. This heir, our heirship looks uh, forward to our adoption. Then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature or creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now what does this mean? It means that all of God's creatures are literally standing on tiptoe waiting to see what God's going to do when our sonship, our heirship, our adoption is consummated at the redemption of our body. The, the, the whole of the angelic host in heaven, they know that something great is going to happen. And they're, they're standing on a tiptoe. Don't you know, we found the scripture uh, where it says that uh, uh, the Joy in heaven among the angels that every time one person is brought into the kingdom. And, and the angels know that something terrific is going on. And all of God's creatures, the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim and all of the angelic hosts, they're waiting on tiptoe until they're going to see what God is going to do at our manifestation. The manifestation or the bringing forth, or the showing forth of the sons of God, the children of God. And this uh, adoption, when we are actually adopted into the family of God, is yet to take place. But we've been given the earnest to, to show us that God is going to do it, and he'll not back out on the deal because you're sealed by the spirit of promise, he said. And it's going to happen. It's just as surely going to take place. And then just as sure as one day you became, came before your God and acknowledged yourself as a lost sinner and received Christ as your Savior, just as sure as that, it's already predetermined that you personally will be manifested at the manifestation of the sons of God. And this is your adoption. This is when you're adopted into the family of God. See, a child, when he's adopted, he receives all of the prerogatives of the family. Now, you don't have that yet. Uh, you just, uh, you're just subject to some uh, other claims. You're subject to the claims of illness. 
and you're subject to the claims of death, and you're subject to the claims of your own human nature, and you're subject to the claims of Satan to some extent, and you're subject to the, uh, the foibles of this world and the governments of this world. See, you're, you haven't come into the manifestation of your adoption into the sonship. That is yet to come. So your redemption is not yet. When Jesus Christ was talking about the very last days in the 21st chapter of Luke, you can read it. He says, when you see all of these things come to pass, you can know that your redemption draweth not. He means the completion of your redemption. I don't remember the verse, but it's in Luke 21. I should learn my Bible. <laughs> well, if you don't believe in predestination, the only problem is when people use the word predestination, they don't all mean the same thing. But what God means here in the fifth verse, the first chapter of Ephesians, he says, if you've received Christ as your Savior, if you've been sealed with the Spirit of promise, you're predestined to be adopted into the family someday. It's predetermined. And there's no way in the world it can be unpredetermined. It's not in your hands or in the hands of Satan or in the hands of anybody else. It's in the hands of God Almighty and He has put down the earnest money. And I believe now if God puts down some earnest money, he wouldn't ever put up the earnest money if he didn't plan to go through with it. Do you think God would put down earnest money for your soul and say, look, I thank you, here's my spirit of promise, and here's the earnest, and uh, I may or may not back out on the deal before it goes through? Why, oh, that's the most absurd thing I ever heard of. It just couldn't be. He wouldn't put down the earnest money to start with, would he? How in the world people get such foolish ideas about a God, I don't ever know. He says here again in the 14th verse, I get excited about some of these lessons like this. Uh, uh, verse 14 of first chapter season, who is the earnest of our inheritance and the redemption until the redemption of the purchased possession under the phrase of this glory. It's just like if that little boy went into there, that pawn shop, I imagine when he went in there, that wasn't part of the story, but I imagine if he had a quarter in his pocket, he probably went up to that pawn shop owner and said, look, if I give you my quarter as earnest money, will you hold that boat till I can earn enough money to, to purchase the thing? Well, see, that's what God has done. He's paid the, the earnest money. He's put down the quarter. You need to be sure you're going to come back and get we get the whole business. And that's what he's talking about here. My goodness, if we just read this Bible and, and, and figure out what it says, you know, and, and believe it, this is why the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, when you read this stuff, you say, man doesn't write like that. Why, you can't read a novel, or you can't read the, the greatest literature that's ever been written. It doesn't sound like that. This is not the way man puts things together. Why, this has to be the finger of God. That's why the Word gives you faith. And nobody can shake it. Why, I read, I believe, in the newspaper today, some guy had proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that there were two Isaiahs instead of one. Yeah, Let me all read that. He says there wasn't but one chance in, in uh, 100,000. Well, that one out of one, that's the one that's going to get it. Now, again, you know why I know that? Because Jesus Christ quoted from Isaiah, and so did the Apostle Paul. And he quoted from both parts of it, and he said, Isaiah wrote both of them. And I just naturally born believe that the Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul knew more about it. Now, I'm glad that guy left him one out, didn't he? <laughs> but, you know, you don't need but one out of 100,000, do you? <laughs> Just one chance. That's enough for me. They have all the, the 99,999 other chances. They, they're just wasted. They go down the drain. John, I had a, a Sunday school class uh, about three or four years ago. 
and there was uh, a whole Sunday's lesson based on why there were two eyes there. And uh, uh, I, I didn't think at that time that it held water. I uh, didn't use the lesson, but it's interesting to see. Well, we, it's nice to debate about now. That those that think they do, they're going to have to change their mind someday. And us that and, and know there's one, we're not going to ever have to change them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should have done that when we come to there's about 200 years difference between the two Isaiahs, starting with the 44th chapter through the 66th. There's about 200, according to the computer, there's about 200 years difference in the, in the language. Well, I'll tell you, if that computer doesn't work any better than that one does down at my home office, you put out our village. <laughs> No I don't believe it's good either. We never had this much. We never had anywhere near this many mistakes when they did it with people. Don't tell me that. I'm just doing shit. <laughs> <laughs> Here, we're gonna have fun. I can tell a lot of people a lot of things about computers. <laughs> well, let's see. What was our redemption price? Well, in, in Ephesians 1, 7, it says we have redemption through his blood. Let's see if we can learn a little bit more about that. In uh, 1 Peter 1, 18. 1 Peter 1, 18. I know that my Redeemer liveth, says Job. First Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. You know, around here we think silver and gold is incorruptible. But God called silver and gold corruptible. We're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your vain conversation or manner of life received by tradition from your fathers and how vain that is. Thank you, Mr. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It says here that the purchase price was the blood of Christ. That, that was the, the purchase price. Well, we'll find that one more time in Revelation 5, 9. We'll see to what extent that purchase price avails. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open its seals, for thou hast was slain and hast redeemed us to God, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us thy God, kings and priests, and we shall reign or be heirs upon the earth. Now here's what it means by the fact that the blood was your purchase price. You see, blood is for this world. It's life in this blood. Your life is in your blood. It's your blood is not alive, you're not alive. First thing that deteriorates uh, upon the death of a person is the blood. Blood is the life. And when Christ gave his blood, it means he forfeited his right to live on this earth. Now, he forfeited more than you forfeit if you were to die, because, you see, he never sinned. And death only comes by sin. And if Christ hadn't have died on the cross, he'd still be alive. He'd be a pretty big wheel, wouldn't he? He'd go through all the generations. But he forfeited that right to live on this earth. So that you might receive, uh, you, you might uh, receive eternal life or be a, uh, adopted into the family of God. This was the ransom price. The forfeiture is his right to live. And so when it says you were purchased by the blood of Christ, means that the purchase price was the forfeiture of his right 
to live on this earth in his humanity. And we're going to see that in our next study on Emmanuel. So do we understand? Well, we're not going to have time to get into it much, but we'll take on Emmanuel anyway, won't we? Uh, so um, this is what it means to be redeemed. Christ was your ransom price. His, his forfeiting of his right to carry on life on this earth was the price that was paid for you. All right. Our next word is Emmanuel. And we turn first to Isaiah 7, 14. Where it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, what does that mean? Let's turn to Matthew 123. That was a prediction that Isaiah was written 700 years before the day. 700 and some years before the birth of Christ. And then in Matthew 1, 23, we have a quotation. We have the same quotation with a little addition. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. So we call him Emmanuel when we want to speak of the very God, the Creator, the God of all, becoming a human being. This is his Emmanuel nature, and this speaks of his first coming, or when he was here before. God became man. God became one of us. God with us, Emmanuel. See, pretty soon we're going to uh, find that he called himself the Son of Man. This speaks of his human act, uh, his human nature. He descended from the human race because he was born of a woman. But he's still God with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Some people say that the Bible doesn't claim that Jesus Christ is God. So the very name Emmanuel means God with us. That's what he's called, God with us. Now this is explained in the book of John. Chapter 1, 10 and 11. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. See, God with us. God coming to his own. He made this world. He made that which was in this world. God came to this world in the person of Jesus Christ. God came to his own, but his own received him not. And here we have the 12th verse, but as many as did receive him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You were born not of blood, nor the will of uh, uh, the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Emmanuel, God with us. God with us, dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So you see, grace and truth came down the man. Grace means uh, unmerited favor. In truth, Jesus says, I am the truth. Grace and truth came to be with man in the person of Jesus Christ. So his name is Emmanuel, God with us. Now what was the process? 
First, I guess we better turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and see uh, that expounded upon them. We're going to run a little over time tonight. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2. We started a little late, so. Hebrews 2 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things. Here's the same thought you see that you had in John, the first chapter. For it became him, that is Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. This is talks of our adoption when we're taken into glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect, or perfect as the captain that is, through suffering, uh, for both he that sanctifieth or sets apart for God and they who are set apart, all are one, uh, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. See, God with us, uh, calling us his brethren. Now he's going to quote some Old Testament scripture saying, I will declare thy name unto my brother, in the midst of the church will I sing praise, and again I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children of God, the children God has given to me, calling us the children of God. 14th verse, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that is to say, because you are flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that is flesh and blood, that through death, through his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them through who fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't become an angel. But he took upon him the, the seed of Abraham. Now we've told you once before that you see angels can't be redeemed. Only human beings can be redeemed. One third of all the angelic hosts were tricked by Satan into falling, but they're doomed, doomed to the lake of fire. Not one single angel can get saved. Now the angels are a higher order of beings than you are, because see, it said in a, a, a two nine, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. See, he he came all the way down through the the strata that the angels are to our level to redeem us. Uh, there's a song that says that angels can't be seen. Uh, when we get to heaven and sing redemption story, the angels will fold their wings because they can't sing redemption story. You ever heard that song? Uh, who, who said that song about? And when we sing redemption story, the angels shall fold their wings. Good. Uh, they were not permitted to sing. Anyway, the, the song about redemption story. No angel will ever be redeemed. There's no purchase price been paid for them. Aren't you glad you're not an angel? <laughs> <laughs> he took not upon himself the nature of angels. Now in Philippians, the second chapter, we have the, what are known as the seven steps that Christ took downward in his descent from his place in glory. And uh, you, we're going to finish our lesson tonight by looking into that. This has to do with the Emmanuel nature of Christ, God with us. And we're going to see here in the book of Philippians, we're going to see God the Son in the process of stepping down. You can count them. Philippians chapter 2. You can't find Philipp Philippians. Remember our little deal. We'll get every part correct. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Comes between Ephesians and Colossians. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. What mind was in him? Who, being in the form of God, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In the book of John, the fifth chapter, in the eighteenth verse, 
we're told, John 5, 18, we're told that the religious leaders wanted to put Christ to death because he made himself equal with God. That was the charge against him. Thou makest thou self equal with God. And he didn't mind making himself equal with God. And by asked him, he said, yes, I'm God the Son. I'm very God. He could tell anybody this. So he wasn't, he wasn't afraid. And you wouldn't go around telling people you're God, would you? But he did. So he thought it not robbery or, or something out of the way to call himself equal with God, because he was. But he left that position. He made himself of no reputation. Now this is the first step down. This literally means that he emptied himself of his visible glory. That is to say, he agreed to divest himself of his divine prerogative, not of his divinity, but of his divine prerogative. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has never been lower than the angels, but in his humanity he took on a position lower than the angels. Uh, you can see this because all through his earthly walk, you know, he always called upon his divine power to help others. But he never once invoked his divine powers for his own benefit. He had not where to lay his hand. Never will you find anywhere in his earthly walk where he used any of his divine powers for himself. Uh, he said one time that he could call twelve legions of angels. He says, uh, when Peter took out the sword and cut off the servant's ear, he put it back on the guy. And he says, uh, don't you know, Peter, that uh, I could uh, speak the word and twelve legions of angels would come immediately? But you see, he never exercised any divine prerogative for his own benefit. And this is what this means, that he made himself of no reputation. That is to say, he didn't enforce his prerogative. So this was his first step. When he's stepping down, see, he's in this exalted, glorified position. He steps down. He says, I'm going to step down from that. I'm going to divest myself of any divine protection and prerogative. Uh, you would, uh, it would be like a, a king who had on his crown and his scepter and all of his royal courtiers, and he would say, no, I want to go among the people and observe the people without any divine prerogative or without any kingly prerogative. And let's suppose he took away all of his, clothes, put on the clothes of a poor man so he could walk around among the people. Well, he'd be subject to whatever the people were. Somebody might hit him over the head or what have you. He would have divested himself of his kingly prerogative. And this is what Jesus did. Well, this was his first step down. He made himself of no reputation. That is, and he emptied himself of, of, of what, he, what he was. Second step. He took upon him the form of a serpent. Now, he could have stepped down from his divine prerogative without that stepping all the way down to a position of servitude. See, he could have he could have stepped down to the level of a king, couldn't he? And still, then he would be, he could have said, look, I'm the God the Creator. I'm the great Almighty One. And so that I can understand people better, I'm going to step down and be a king on earth. He could have done that. That wouldn't have been a, a terrific step down, would it? But you see, he didn't. He stepped down below that to a position of a servant. He says he took upon himself the position of a servant. That's the second step. And made himself in the likeness of men. This is the third step. You see, he could have stepped down to being an angel. An angel's a servant. The archangel's a servant. Every, uh, he's at God's back and call. He could have divested himself of his divine prerogative and step down uh, to be a servant of God in the person of an angel. But he didn't step down just to the angelic level. 
that we found in Hebrews, he stepped all the way down to become a human servant. That's the third step now. Uh, made in the likeness of man, being formed, uh, being found fashionable, he humbled himself. Now this means he took a place of humility or a humble man, not just a man. He let himself come into humble surroundings. This is teaches of his humble birth and his humble uh, environment in his boyhood and so forth. He could have come down and see at a, a position, he could have been a servant in a king palace or something like that. He didn't do that. He took a, a humble place in his, uh, this is, uh, what's that, our fourth step? Mm -hmm. Humble himself. He became obedient. Obedient. Now, you could be a servant and not always be obedient, couldn't you? You could take on the position of a, uh, of a servant and say, well, now, look, I'm going to obey. But after all, I'm just taking on this position uh, temporarily, and uh, if I don't like what's going on, well, I'm going to man I'm going to uh, manifest myself. This is what Satan tried to get him to do, you know, uh, in the temptation. Tried to get him to take upon himself some of his divine prerogatives. Says, well, you've been a good servant, and you've been in a humble position, but but why don't you just uh, let everybody know just who you are? And so he could have been a servant and not been an obedient servant. But he he stepped down to a place of obedience. And the next step, unto death, unto death, he was obedient unto the Father all the way to the death. Now you see, all through his life he was an obedient servant. And remember when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he, and he asked the Father if it be his will, to let this cup pass from me, to Father, let this cup pass from me, he meant what he was going into. He said, nevertheless, thy will be done. In other words, it might have been enough for him to live the humble life and been a humble servant without a place to lay his head, without any possession, any position, and lived on that low level. But no, it said, he was obedient, not only in life, but even to death. Now, this was quite a travail. You need only to read the account in all four Gospels. It brought forth great drops of sweat as though it was blood. I don't know whether he sweated blood or not, but he was like sweating blood. So it was, it was a real travail. So he sat down, even to death. And then the seventh step, death on a cross. You see, he could have died as a martyr. He, uh, many men are glorified in their death. But you see, the cross was the most ignominious form of death. Only the vilest criminals were ever crucified. Only those uh, who uh, were to be shown in utter contempt. When a uh, person was to be crucified, uh, they were uh, forced to carry the crossbar, the cross, on their back to their place of crucifixion. And uh, they were always spat upon, and they were ridiculed. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the most humiliating form of death. So he took upon himself the most humiliating form of death, not just death, not to see some, some people die in a blaze of glory. Even the fellows that die in Vietnam get some glory, don't they, in death. But no, he, he died in, in the most ignominious way, death on a cross. And it says, if you want to follow him, it says, you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. A lot of people interpret that as saying, take up the cross of Christ. No, that's not what it means. It doesn't mean you can take the reproach of Christ. It means to go to your own funeral. That's what it means. Go to your own execution. That's what it means to take up your cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. That means attend your own crucifixion. 
say death to self. Count yourself as dead with Christ. Because <clears throat> if you want to follow him, that's the way to do it. That's what he did. So the greatest God of all stepped down from his divine prerogative, stepped down to become a humble human servant of very lowest degree with obedience in life and even unto death, and death on the cross. These were the, these, this is known here as the seven steps downward. I guess I ought to show you the seven steps up too, that That's in the book of Luke. Uh, maybe we'll get that some other time. We'll be over there instead of some of this other. But notice in, in this next uh, verse, in the ninth verse, Wherefore, because of this, God also has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Who else has forty names? That's just part of it. Who else are name, known by these forty names? He has a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, every human being, including Castro and uh, those arrogant uh, Russian leaders and others, every human being that's ever going to born, be born one day is going to be forced to confess the glory of this person. Aren't you glad that you do it voluntarily? instead of being forced? Aren't you glad that somehow God taught you to humble yourself to the extent that you would exalt the name now instead of then? That's what we're doing. We're exalting the name of Christ by showing forth all of these names. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take us to get through this list if we're only going to do one or two or nine. Uh, so we've been on it two nights, we've only got two three names. <laughs> well, let's uh, give a word of thanks to the Lord. Dear God, we thank you that your book is so wonderful and that these truths are so deep and that they bless our hearts so. In Jesus' name, amen.